<clears throat> All right. Well, hey, hello, everyone. Oh, man, that's a, that's a lot of light. Let me kind of adjust that a little bit here. Okay, th that should be all right. Okay. All right. Well, hey, hello, everyone. It's me, the Professor, here. And uh, uh, yes, I am coming to you from the from, uh, from, from the Motor City. Uh, <clears throat> this is my, my last day here, and I'll be back in Southern California the uh, uh, <clears throat> coming up on, uh, on coming up on, on Friday. The, uh, that'd be uh, today, uh, May, May the first. So May the first is uh, when uh, you're going to be uh, seeing this uh, video, and uh, I'll be getting ready to uh, to, to leave here. Uh, but yes, this is the last of the uh, uh, review videos on the uh, Ken Burns uh, Jazz series, and uh, uh, and today I'm trying to get the get the lighting here. Let's see if I can, if I can fix it properly. Oh, okay, I think you guys can see me right right uh, right there. Um, I want to go ahead and say a few things about the uh, final installment, uh, part ten. That's the uh, masterpiece by Midnight episode. So I'll say a few things, say a few things about that, and then I'll get into a little bit of uh, uh, why I think this uh, exercise was uh, um, not so much necessary, but uh, important and a vital addition uh, to uh, vital addition uh, to, to to the class. Uh, but first, let me quickly go over a couple of uh, bookkeeping items uh, with respect to the uh, Ken Burns series. Uh, uh, as you know, this is something that I mentioned in my first video uh, from, a, from a few weeks ago. Uh, you do have the assignment, which is due a week from uh, you know, a week from May, uh, today, May 1st. So, that's so, uh, so next Friday, May 8th, is when you turn in your comparative uh, essay assignment. That means you compare uh, two of the uh, you know, two of the episodes, so any two that, that, that you wish. So if you want to examine more of the earlier stuff, so if you're interested in, say, the work of Louis Armstrong when he was getting started, uh, Bix Beiderbecke, Bi Bi Fletcher Henderson, uh, those people, when Duke Ellington was getting started, so if you want to work on, on, on two of those episodes, absolutely go ahead and do that or if you want to compare more of the uh, later episodes so if you're interested in the, the works of Miles Davis, uh, John Coltrane, um, uh, uh, Char Charlie Parker then definitely you can go that route and, com and compare and contrast themes from two of the later episodes or if you want to do a, uh, a wide panorama that is if you want to compare topics from the first episode when Louis Armstrong was just getting started in New Orleans or anything with this episode in which uh, we get to the end of both uh, uh, Satchmo and uh, and Duke Ellington's life. Uh, Miles Davis completely changes his uh, his style in terms of going into a fusion jazz, and we meet more of the, I guess you might say the uh, Young Turks, uh, people like 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 Winton Marcellus and a brother M Bradford M M M M Marcellus. They start coming into their own, as mentioned in this in this episode. So again, choose any two of those episodes and prepare an essay and get that into me next Friday, May 8th. And remember, everybody, I've got detailed instructions in terms of what you have to look out for. So there are three main elements you need to be looking out for. I'm not going to go over that here. Now, all that stuff is listed in the assignment worksheet. And in and, and the second page of the worksheet, I tell you exactly how I'd like to see you structure your, your, your paragraphs. It's very important that all of you have a good grasp on write, and writing good paragraphs. Um, and I saw great evidence of that. Majority of you did that quite nicely with the EBSCO re review. So for those of you who already uh, demonstrate that, definitely keep things going for this assignment and the, and the book review. Uh, but for those of you who might have struggled with the EBSCO assignment, especially with their paragraphs, look at what I have on page two of the assignment worksheet for the, uh, for, for the uh, uh, Ken Burns assignment. I outline what you should indicate in each paragraph, um, uh, go, go, go point by point. And, and in terms of length of the paragraphs, try to keep your paragraphs within the range of, say, about uh, maybe one, uh, one, one half to about seven eighths of a page, a little bit, little bit more than a little bit more than three quarters of a page, not quite one full page. But if you follow that uh, that uh, pattern for all your paragraphs, I guarantee that you have a very good chance of uh, earning a strong grade. Again, the majority of you already uh, already proved that with the EBSCO assignment. So for those of you who uh, who didn't and your grades uh, indicate that, especially for those of you who might have uh, earned uh, B minuses and the C plus uh, C category, then uh, with the uh, with this assignment, with the jazz assignment. Now's your chance to uh, clean up your paragraphs. All right. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the episode, and then I'll say some final comments about uh, about the about the series and about uh, jazz in, uh, in 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 general. Um, this episode looks at the later years of jazz, and it's sort of a uh, I wouldn't say erratic episode, but it looked like when Ken Burns was trying to complete the episode, he didn't really know what what time frame to stop in because. Uh, uh, where, where episode nine left off, we're getting into the 1960s, where the middle parts of the 1960s. So uh, John Coltrane is still uh, still make, making music. Miles Davis was still doing a lot of his uh, um, 
I guess you might say the uh, uh, birth of uh, birth of the cool kind of blue t type of stuff. So uh, Davis was still doing more or less the uh, uh, standard types of jazz, and then uh, uh, and then we're getting into the uh, early stages, early stages of the uh, bossa nova movement with people like Stan Getz, João Gilberto, uh, uh, his then wife Astrud Gilberto, Astrud Gilberto. Astrud Gilberto, who wasn't mentioned in the in, in the series, but she was the one, of course, who sang uh, the English lyrics on uh, on "Girl from I I I I I I Girl from I I Ipanema." <clears throat> um, um, so, well, so my point is, while the first nine episodes seem to have a pretty good structure in terms of time frame, it seemed that Burns in chap in part ten didn't really know where to, where to end the uh, where to end the program. Um, he tried to cover it. It seemed like he tried to cover too many years in just uh, in just a two hours of a program. I thought he did a pretty good job of it, but I think Burns knew that he was in sort of a no-win situation, and maybe the fact that the episode had a bit of an unfinished quality of it, maybe that was the point that Burns was trying to make. So in any event, a lot of the topics that were seen in the episode uh, start off with the idea that by the early 1960s, jazz was going in so many different directions. Uh, as the uh, as the narrator Keith David pointed out, it looks like jazz is like a Tower of Babel. There's a hard bop, a modal jazz, cool jazz, free jazz, avant avant garde jazz, and a uh, bossa nova, uh, and many many other styles. A fusion jazz, which was what Miles Davis uh, uh, perfected, which we'll see a little bit more a little bit more in the episode. But the fact that jazz was going into so many different directions seemed to illustrate that American life in the 1960s was also going into many different directions, politically, economically, socially. Of course, you got the civil rights movement. You had the uh, social unrest. Of course, we're seeing stuff happening in places like Baltimore right, right now. And then earlier, of course, we had that uh, tragic situation unfold outside of St. Louis in, in, in Ferguson. But 1960s, uh, cities all across the uh, all across the country had so many social conflicts. Of course, Los Angeles with the Watts riots, and here, here, here in Detroit, uh, you had the infamous 1967 riots, and the 67 riots essentially were the ones which, uh, which really sped up the idea of a white, a white flight, which of course is where the uh, uh, white uh, 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 middle class and uh, uh, white middle class and upper middle class people leave the uh, leave the cities and head towards the suburbs. And here in Detroit. Uh, that case was really, really, uh, really, really uh, sympt uh, symptomatic in, in that people were leaving uh, Detroit and going to cities like uh, like like uh, Birmingham, uh, Ro Rochester, uh, uh, Sterling Heights. That is, these are the, the counties in uh, uh, in Oakland and uh, and uh, and uh, and Macomb counties, um, leaving Detroit. Uh, where the majority of African American population, and to this day, uh, Detroit's population is predominantly about 75-80% Af African American. But a lot of that, again, was a legacy of the uh, of the riots uh, in Detroit. But other cities too had, had problems. Newark had a uh, had a bad situation in 1967. Uh, Rochester, uh, and of course, I mentioned uh, Los Angeles uh, just a few uh, moments earlier. And of course, with the uh, with respect to the uh, Chicano movement, uh, you also had some uh, some uh, tragic episodes unfold with respect to what's happening with the Chicano, with the Mexican-American communities. These are things I get into a lot more detail with my gross, my, I'm sorry, with my uh, Mesa and, uh, and Southwestern college classes. Um, and in this conflict, and uh, so in essence, jazz seems to reflect a lot of what's happening, what's happening here in terms of the changes in the country. But also, too, jazz was being affected uh, by other styles of, of, of music, too. And of course, rock and roll, uh, Rock and roll really, uh, uh, um, really, you might say, weakened jazz momentum. We saw a little bit about that in episode nine. But of course, once the Beatles and the British Invasion came on the scene, of course, not just the Beatles, but the Rolling Stones, uh, uh, the, the the Who, the the the, the Kinks, uh, I guess other lesser known bands like say the uh, Dave Clark Five, uh, <clears throat> I guess Hermits Hermits come in, into the picture. Uh, but the Beatles were definitely the, the one which caused a lot of problems for jazz artists. Many uh, artists, as we see with Dexter Gordon at the beginning of the episode, they, had, they don't really have much place to, uh, uh, to go to, to play in the 1960s. So they go over to, to Europe, so places like, like Paris, like Amsterdam, Copenhagen. These were, you might say, uh, uh, were, which we might uh, consider to be the, uh, the refuges, the safe havens for a lot of these uh, uh, jazz musicians who couldn't really find much work uh, in, the, in the United States. Mm -hmm. 
But I mentioned that there were all, all kinds of different types of uh, uh, types of jazz in terms of styles. Uh, John Coltrane at this point in time was experimenting with more, shall we say, a spiritual, a uh, religious uh, type type of type of, 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 of type of music or a, or a sa sacred music. I guess was a term that was mentioned in the uh, that, that was mentioned in the uh, uh, in, in the episode. Or avant-garde religious music was another term that that was uh, mentioned. Uh, Coltrane released about ten albums between 1964 and 1966. One of them uh, one of the albums was called A Love Supreme, which is called in the uh, series a in the, in the episode a four-part devotional suite. Uh, so whereas Duke Ellington earlier was getting involved in making lo long, longer compositions known as suites, Coltrane too was doing that. But sadly, Coltrane, uh, much like John Lennon, who died in 1940 under uh, uh, tragic circumstances, we all know the story what happened to uh, to him. Uh, Coltrane also died at age 40, this time from this time from cancer. So, uh, so Coltrane, in essence, as mentioned in the episode, was like a, a meteor. Uh, he had a, a a strong impact within the span of about a uh, little over 10 years. And uh, much like artists like. Uh, more contemporary artists, whether it was uh, people like uh, like Kurt Cobain uh, 20 years ago, or people like Jimi Hendrix, uh, Janis Joplin, uh, and I, and I would also add some rock and roll guys like Keith Moon of the Who, uh, John Bonham of uh, of Led Zeppelin, and you can toss in John Lennon too. These people who came who came came in quickly, made a lot in their short lives and careers, and then passed away at all too tragic a young age. So Coltrane, I would say, definitely fits into into that uh, into the, that that category. Um, but while Coltrane was getting in, involved in, uh, so we say, sacred religious music, others were getting more interested in protest music. So Charles Mingus was one who got into that uh, into that uh, genre with a uh, with a song called "Fables of Phobos," which is a direct attack on the segregationist governor of Arkansas, Orville Phobos. He was the one uh, whom we saw in the previous episode when Louis Armstrong uh, refused to. Uh, go on that State Department during the Soviet Union because of, of the events happening in a Little Rock at Central High School. Uh, Cecil Taylor was getting involved in what was called the, in, uh, um, in, in some uh, avant-garde piano. Branford Marcellus uh, didn't really think too much uh, of it. He has some colorful language, uh, as you've probably seen already in terms of describing uh, Cecil Taylor's uh, style. And they had, and had a group called the Art Ensemble of Chicago. But this wild and erratic uh, music, you might say, got its base from what Ornette Coleman had done about uh, about ten years uh, about ten years er er earlier. So I guess comp so uh, Coleman in the '59, his style was seen as wild, frenetic, or herky jerky. I guess what people like uh, Cecil Taylor were doing were even more uh, way way out there, far out, man, uh, that type of thing than what uh, Ornette Coleman was doing uh, just a few years er er earlier. Okay. Um, the other uh, the other music style that's mentioned I mentioned this a little a little bit a little bit early on uh, at the start of the video was the uh, was the rise of the bossa nova movement the music from from upper Brazil so it was a uh, Stan Getz and Charlie Bird a guitarist who were the American artists you might say helped to uh, uh, popularize it for an American audience but in terms of the uh, main movement and shakers from Brazil we're talking about people like João Gilberto uh, who was a guitarist and still around today I think he still perf performs so often not uh, uh, Gilberto, from what I understand, is a bit of a, a reclusive, enigmatic, mercurial figure. Um, I, I don't think he tours the U.S. Uh, that that much, but from time to time you'll see his name pop up in festivals in Paris, or Montreux, in uh, Switzerland, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and other 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 foreign nations. But he's still around. Uh, Antonio Carlos Jobim unfortunately passed away about 20 years ago, but he was the main writer of a lot of these songs. So to go from Ipanema Desafinado. Uh, these were things that that uh, that, that uh, Jobim created. Uh, Aguas de Marzo, Waters of March, which is not mentioned in the film, but is a classic Brazilian song. Uh, that was another of uh, Jobim's uh, compositions. Okay, let me move on now to to Miles Davis. And uh, Miles Davis, for for his part, he recognizes that the times were changing by the end of the 1960s. That what he did in 1959 wasn't as popular as what's happening in 1968, 1969. Um, uh, so Davis had put together a pretty good uh, a qu a quintet with people like Ron Carter, Tony Williams, Herbie Hancock, and Wayne Shorter. In fact, Herbie Hancock, of course, is still around to, to this day. Uh, uh, maybe this might be a little bit before for your time, but uh, Hancock gained a lot of popularity in the mid-80s with a song, R uh, Rocket. Which had a really, uh, uh, which had a really bizarre music video with all kinds of these uh, 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 goofy creatures, uh, uh, um, 
uh, uh, mannequins, uh, crazy birds, that type of thing. I think uh, Hancock actually won an, an award uh, for from MTV back in those days. So, uh, so basically, my, my point is. When Davis uh, did a lot of this uh, fusion stuff in 1969, 1970, that's where the albums like uh, Bitches Brew, which is mentioned prominently in, in, in the episode, and then the one he, which he did a little bit later, uh, Miles Davis on, 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 Miles Davis on, 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 on the corner, uh, uh, jazz purists thought, oh my gosh, what's Miles doing? This stuff is wild, and it's this, it's wacky, blah, blah, blah. I think a lot of the people... Uh, Felt the same way when Herbie Hancock came out with his with his album, which had uh, Rocket uh, and a few other songs. His name escaped escaped me. So you might say Hancock was learning from from his master, uh, uh, where uh, uh, Davis just uh, uh, about a decade and a half or previous uh, 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 to to that. Okay. Um, all right. Um, and the episode wraps up with, uh, with uh, and, and rightly so, with what happens in the final years of uh, two of the legends who've pretty much been with us the entirety of the series. We're talking, of course, about Satchmo and, 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 and the Duke, Duke Ellington. Um, Louis Armstrong uh, was in declining health by 1970, and uh, he was able to perform uh, at the Newport, uh, Newport uh, Jazz Festival at the encouragement of George Ween, the famous uh, pr promoter at the time. Um, <clears throat> And uh, uh, as we saw through the epi through the episodes, uh, Armstrong lived. A, I wouldn't say. I guess yeah. You say a very, very hard life, a tough life. He was always on the road. He never seemed to turn uh, turn down down a gig. He was always uh, he was always there, always performing. And it finally caught up to him. And uh, he dies in July of 19, 1971. Duke Ellington, for his part, uh, he he's still quite active too. In fact, if anything, despite the death of his longtime uh, partner in crime, Billy Strayhorn. Uh, Duke uh, writes many more, uh, many more long compositions, long, 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 long uh, uh, suites. Um, but uh, like, uh, uh, like it, like his colleague uh, uh, Satchmo, uh, uh, Duke also passes away in the early 1970s, diagnosed with lung cancer. He dies in May of 1974. Incidentally, those of you who are fans of Stevie Wonder, you probably heard the song "Sir Duke." "Sir Duke," of course, is a tribute to Duke Ellington. The song came out, I think, within the span of about a year, year and a half, couple of years after uh, uh, Ellington's uh, de death. Mm. Okay, uh, the end of this episode looks at you might say some of the uh, <clears throat> some of the trouble. Facing a lot of the uh, a lot of the jazz a lot of the jazz clubs in in, uh, in in the era, in that many clubs were closed, many uh, many of them were were, were demolished. Uh, in fact, I guess Miles Davis uh, reportedly said in nineteen in, in the mid nineteen seventies that jazz was over, jazz was dead, it was this, it was that, blah 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 blah. And for a time, it looked like that that appeared to be the case. But when Dexter Gordon made his way back to the United States and opened at the uh, at the club called the Village Vanguard. Um, there looked like there was a bit of a renewal, a bit of a bit of a renaissance, and I think part of the reason is because that the mid 1970s, of course, were a chaotic time for the nation with respect to Vietnam and and Watergate. And uh, my feeling is that uh, even though there's a lot of good protest music going on in the 1960s and 1970s, whether it's Bob Dylan, uh, Pete Seeger, Joan ba Baez, uh, Country Joe and the Fish, uh, Buffalo Springfield, and of course Crosby, Stills and Nash, uh, maybe by the mid 70s, Americans were tired of that protest music and maybe weren't too in, in, enthusiastic about things like uh, like 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 disco so maybe from that uh, maybe that uh, uh, context gave jazz an opening to to come back into the uh, uh, to, to come back and uh, fill a void fill a niche in the American uh, cultural land landscape so with both Dexter Gordon and then Art Blakey who uh, who uh, brought together a new band of a new uh, version of the jazz messengers jazz you might say picked up in the 1970s and uh, and kept going on and still going on to, uh, to, to this day and it's from Art Blakey's group where of course uh, people like Winfred Marcellus uh, Winton Marcellus really got uh, really got started as uh, Marcellus himself tells you toward the end toward the end of the uh, end of the episode mm. okay and let me see what else I, sh I should mention here uh, uh, about this so unfortunately, uh, the episode doesn't quite get into events. Uh, even though there is a mention of uh, of artists, it looks like Burns just uh, added those artists uh, uh, quickly at the end of the episode. But he didn't really get into a lot in terms of uh, maybe the the rise of, uh, of of smooth jazz. And and smooth jazz, we're talking people like say uh, Larry Carlton, Pat Metheny, uh Kenny G, 
uh, Diana Krall and and and, 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 uh, and many and, uh, and ma many others. Maybe if Burns had did, done two more episodes, he could have mentioned some of the some of those people uh, in, uh, in it. But like I said, if, like I said earlier, it seemed that even though there was a bit of an incomplete feeling uh, about the series, despite the fact that uh, that you've watched about 20 hours of uh, of stuff over these past 10, 10 weeks. Uh, I think what Burns is trying to say is that, like the American nation, jazz is incomplete. Jazz is constant, constantly uh, changing. And uh, we see that going on in the political landscape right, right, right now because look at how fractured the Republican Party is at this point in time. You've got the Tea Party people, whether it's a Ted Cruz, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, <clears throat> Uh, and, and then even and even though Rand Paul is a uh, is you might see in the Tea Party vein his idea, especially in terms of social issues, it's much more different than say what uh, people like uh, Cruz, uh, Mike Huckabee, Sarah Palin are all about. And then you've got the quote establishment Republicans, where that's where uh, Jeb Bush com comes in, into the picture. And even within the Democratic Party, even though the uh, the idea is well, it's Hillary, uh, she's you know, she's got it, blah blah blah. But even among the Republican, the Democratic Party. There you have some uh, some people who uh, have you might say different perspectives. We're talking about Senator Elizabeth Warren and Senator Ber 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 Bernie Sanders. So, um, and of course, you look at the news whether you're watching Fox or MSNBC. There's always this idea: we got to take back America. America belongs to to us. Blah blah blah. This, this and that. Um, um, but. Uh, to me, that that just gives the impression that even in the American political system, nobody can agree on anything. And I think the founding fathers probably un, uh, probably un understood that more than anybody. They knew how uh, people were, how people re reacted. Uh, Alexander Hamilton himself, uh, uh, in fact, if anything, he hated the people. He hated the masses. He thought they were dumb. They were bumpkins. They were clowns. They were goons, thugs. So you get you get the idea. So Hamilton, along with James Madison, they really believed that you have to have a strong central government. You might say keep the people in line, uh, keep the masses in, in, in line, because they're all too uh, uh, um, they're all too dictated by their by their basic emotions, anger. Uh, Sadness, greed, uh, uh, lust, and, and, and envy, uh, gluttony, sloth—all uh, uh, of those types of uh, types types of notions. And I think what jazz does is jazz reflects all those motions in the in, in the American la uh, landscape the, the American psyche. So if you're listening to stuff from Miles Davis from 1969-1970, there's a bit of a sense of, of you might say some some anger, maybe some uh, rage against the machine, rage against the system, uh, so to speak. And then you've got people like Billie Holiday talking about how their uh, uh, how how their uh, how uh, her men have wronged her, that they they they're constantly cheating on her, or they uh, uh, they mistreat her. Uh, th th this uh, this this and that. And then if you, you listen to something from say Louis Armstrong with uh, West End Blues, there's like a uh, um, there's like a, a, a longing. There's a sense that Armstrong is reflecting the hopes and aspirations of African Americans in terms of what they want uh, for, from from America. That is, they want the American nation to treat uh, treat them better. So, uh, in other words. Um, West End Blues and, and others of Arm, Armstrong's works at the time in the late late 20s seem to have that sense that of a uh, wanting and yearning and, and, and de desperation. Um, and then you contrast that with people like, say, Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie, really fast, herky-jerky, frenetic stuff. Salt Peanuts uh, song uh, comes to mind. Uh, uh, Co Coco from, uh, from Charlie Parker. Fast pace, rapid pace, this is post-war era. So what guys like Parker and Gillespie were, were doing were clearly reflecting the mood of the nation, the fast a move, um, a mood uh, as the nation gets out of World War II. And in fact, if you've seen any of the Warner Brothers cartoons with Bugs Bunny uh, from 1945 onward, there's definitely, you might say, a fast pace uh, uh, you know, with cars speeding back and forth and uh, or, or the uh, gangsters chasing bugs, uh, come here, wabbit, uh, uh, that, 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 that type of thing. Um, uh, I think that the music really reflects that. So all in all, I think what this uh, assignment, uh, uh, what this assignment uh, symbolizes, it is all these ten episodes, is, is is that in order to understand the uh, the mood of the nation, the the the, uh, the American people, you have to understand popular culture, whether it's uh, uh, things like baseball, whether it's boxing, whether it's uh, gambling, uh, whether it's uh, 
um, uh, whether it's the type of uh, literature that that's going on, even the uh, maybe you might say the cheap stuff, the dime store stuff, and maybe early radio, early uh, television, uh, movies at, at at the time, um, and music is no no, ex no exception too. And um, uh, even though, of course, all of us can debate and say, well, the best music is the uh, is the rock and roll of uh, Aerosmith and a Deep Purple. Uh, or, or the, or actually it's the 80s stuff with uh, Van Halen, early Motley Crue, uh, Judas Priest, that type of thing. No, 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 you're, you're all wrong. It's a, uh, it's a newer, it's uh, um, uh, the, uh, the women, uh, Madonna, Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, M.I.A. You know those types of artists. Uh, I think, um, um, I mean that's subject for for for, for another uh, another debate. I, I I would say. But all in all, I think the, the point of all this is that jazz has been a constant. It's been sort of the uh, soundtrack of the American nation since the beginning of the uh, beginning of the 20th century, with roots dating back to the uh, to the 19th century in, in the uh, in, in the Civil War and even the pre-Civil War it, 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 uh, uh, it, uh, era, a period. And uh, uh, what I want to do with this time was try to capture that, try to uh, uh, try to get a sense of that, try to distill that, uh, so to speak, and, uh, uh, and 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 bring it and bring it to the forefront of, of the class. Yes, I think it's great that in this class we look at well, what's John F. Kennedy doing? What's Richard Nixon doing? We want to know about Bill Clinton. We're interested in uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Uh, we want to know about Eisenhower uh, or the or uh, or the bad guys in this, whether it's a Stalin or a, a Khrushchev, um, um, and of course Hitler. Those people. Yeah, I think it's really important to look at those guys. But let's take a look at what's happening, you might say, uh, beneath the surface in terms of what's happening on the street. What's Charlie Parker doing? Uh, what's Louis Armstrong doing? What's Ella Fitzgerald doing? What's Miles Davis doing? Uh, uh, what's Big Spiderbeck doing? Um, uh, Glenn, Glenn Miller, Artie Shaw, those people. So uh, I, I felt to get a bigger picture of the American landscape, I wanted to take us into popular culture, and I think for these past 10 weeks, uh, 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 I hope that this attempt uh, uh, approved worth, 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 worth a while. So if any of you got interested in, in, some of the, uh, uh, in some of the music and want to hear more, absolutely go for it. Uh, just go on, uh, just go on, uh, on iTunes rate radio uh, or, of course, Spotify. Or if, if you have a Sirius XM, there's there, there's a there's a, a couple of jazz stations there. So f find out more about it. But even if you weren't too thrilled about the assignment and not too thrilled about the music, at least you have an idea. You at least you know who these pe people are. Uh, so um, so if you're watch, watching a, a, a TV show or a movie and someone mentions a Charlie Parker, someone men mentions a, a, a Dizzy Gillespie or uh, Art Art Tatum or Fats Waller, then you know who these people are, and uh, I, I think this gives you a much bigger picture in terms of what the American uh, landscape was all about for the better part of the 20th century. All right, well that's it, everybody. Uh, I hope you've you enjoyed this this exercise, and uh, uh, I'm sure I have at least a couple more videos for you before the semester r r wraps up. But I definitely wanted to make sure that I got this video uh, to you before uh, before quiz 10 o o o opens up. Okay, and one final reminder, everybody, don't forget that next Friday, May 8th, that's when your comparative essays for two episodes are, are going to be due. All right, that's it from here. That's it from the Motor City, and I'll talk to you guys again very soon back from my home headquarters back in the French Valley.